Now we're going to do a subject that uh, uh, you know, I've a lot of questions on, a great interest, or the life of Abraham Lincoln. So where, where do we start from the, you know, from where he's born? Well, when Abraham Lincoln is elected president, of course, there's no CNN, there's no TVs that are telling people <laughs> about this person's life. You have to get some kind of biography, and he was asked to write a simple biography of his life. What was it about? Well, who was he? Um, I mean, he was nationally known to some extent, especially after the Lincoln-Douglas debates. But when he writes out this little biography, he says his life was the short and simple annals of the poor. Now, to a degree, he was right, but not entirely. Uh, his mother and father, along with their parents, traveled through the Cumberland Gap on their way into Kentucky, where they settled. So Lincoln's from Kentucky, born, born there. Uh, his family, though, is from Virginia. It goes back a few generations into Virginia. His mother was actually an illegitimate child. Don't know who the father was. At that time, having a woman have a child out of wedlock was dangerous for her because could she get somebody to marry her and help take care of the child? It's very difficult. She was able to find someone, but we don't know who the father of Abraham Lincoln's mother was. Her name was her name is Nancy. Hmm. Um, Thomas's family, uh, Thomas Lincoln, the Lincolns came over from England uh, originally and settled in the New England states, uh, eventually worked their way down to Pennsylvania, then down to Virginia. And it was Abraham Lincoln, the grandfather of the president, who was the one who moved from the Shenandoah Valley into Kentucky. But they move uh, into Kentucky, uh, The uh, Thomas Lincoln and his um, brothers and sisters and his father, Abraham, and he is, and Abraham is killed. He's actually killed by what we believe is Shawnee warriors um, near what's now uh, kind of Elizabethtown, Kentucky, uh, in that general vicinity. There's actually a park there um, that commemorates that. Um, but because of the inheritance laws that were in existence at that time, Thomas, the youngest son, is not going to be getting any kind of land from his father who's been killed by those Indians. So he has to kind of eke out a meager living um, as a carpenter and a cabinet maker. Actually does really well at that, but it's not the greatest existence. He has to earn a lot, has to earn the money to get to buy land. But he's he meets Nancy, they get married, they, he's, a, he's actually able to save up enough money to buy land in Kentucky and they start, they settle down. They have one child is Sarah, the Abraham Lincoln's oldest uh, sibling and the only sibling, uh, living sibling, sibling he has. So Sarah's born. Then a few years later, Abraham is born. He's named after his grandfather, Abraham. So that's kind of where Abraham Lincoln's ancestry comes in. It's a brief, you know, a brief little summary of his ancestry, but he comes from uh, Virginia stock, at least partially. Uh, but his Ooh. family, when his dad's side came over, um, they were weavers. So the weave cloth textile um, and one of his ancestors was an iron master. So he had an iron furnace and m made all kinds of things with uh, through the iron industry. So that's kind of his ancestry. He's he's going to be born at Sinkin Spring, Kentucky. Uh, and in a one room dirt floor log cabin. OK. So any questions so far? No, no. Uh, well, right. yeah, I do have one. Did they uh, did, did they have any of uh, the previous generation that came from Virginia? Any slaves in the family? No, not, uh, no slaves that we know of. We we do know that Lincoln's father's side was Quakers. Um, probably had, we don't know exactly when they became Quakers, had they been there previously, or, but by the time they're in Pennsylvania, they're Quakers. Once they move into Virginia, they actually become Baptists. Many yeah. of the Baptists, many of the Baptists at this point in time are anti-slavery. Yeah. So we think that's actually part of that lineage of uh, kind of, if you want to say hereditary anti-slavery that Abraham Lincoln picks up is once he gets into, once people are moving into Kentucky, they're getting further and further away from the slave South and moving into the Midwest. And oh. so it's perfect. It's a perfect segue. Um, it was said that to buy land in Kentucky was to buy a lawsuit. 
because there's so <laughs> many people, yeah, you know, because there's so many people doing surveys in Kentucky, and it hasn't been federally surveyed. That means that some surveyors are overlapping. So you may buy uh, buy some land, get it surveyed, but you didn't know that <clears throat> uh, two years ago, another say, surveyor has already came through and surveyed part of that land, and it belongs to somebody else. And so you can go to court. Now, if you go to court, um, that's going to cost a lot of money. You got to get a lawyer. It's much easier just giving up the land and leaving many times, especially for people who do not have the, the convenience of having enough money to go to court. And so that's one reason that Thomas Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's father, and the family, Abraham uh, and Sarah and his mother, moved to Indiana is to get away from these lawsuits and these land surveys that's been uh, improperly done. So they moved to Indiana, set up shop there on Pigeon Creek. At Pigeon Creek, they are they have a pretty decent life. However, it's not too long before Abraham Lincoln's mother uh, gets milk sickness. Milk sickness comes from a cow when it eats white snake root. Uh, it'll eat white snake root. It grows along the tributaries of the Ohio River where they're located, and the cow's milk will start creating an alcohol. It's a poisonous alcohol called trimetol, and it produces um, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, very bad intestinal pain, and many times leads to death. And so his mm. mother will die from milk, si milk sickness while, while they're in Indiana. No. Oh. Abraham Lincoln's father will go to Elizabethtown, Kentucky, find another wife, and she's got uh, children. She was the wife of a jailer in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. She's got a bunch of children with her, and she agrees to marry him, but she's got to pay. Uh, he's got to pay off her debts, and so Thomas Lincoln saves up money, pays off her debts. She marries him. He moves her up to Indiana, and he, she become her name is Sarah Bush Johnston. She becomes Abraham Lincoln's stepmother. Okay. And so these uh, now Lincoln's got not only his sister Sarah, he's got a cousin that's moved in with him, uh, Dennis Hanks, and he's got all these kind of extra brothers and sisters from Sarah Bush Johnston's first marriage. So he's got a big family now. Uh, Lincoln never has a good relationship with his father. His father. Um, one way we can kind of trace back Abraham Lincoln's. Uh, anti-slavery mentality is we can trace it back to his father. Apparently his father didn't like slavery either, but his father was also keen on kind of hiring out Abraham Lincoln to his neighbors. Ah. If neighbors, if neighbors needed work be, to be done, he would hire Abraham Lincoln out to them. And because of the laws, Thomas would get to keep all the money and Abraham Lincoln wouldn't. So, Part of Abraham Lincoln's mentality towards slavery, we, some historians have suggested, because Thomas Lincoln hired him out to work or to neighbors to work, and Thomas would keep the money for the most part, that Lincoln got the mentality that what you work for, you should be given. You know, mm -hmm. you should be entitled to the fruit of your labor. That sticks with him through a through his entire life, and probably is one of the foundations of his anti-slavery stance. But one of the biggest impacts that Lincoln goes through, the biggest events that Lincoln goes through where he encounters slavery. We we suspect they might have saw slavery in Kentucky, but because it's still fairly uh, unpopulated at that point, uh, would he have seen it a lot? Probably not. Uh, the first time we know he sees slavery and sees the horrors of it is when he is actually hired to be on a flatboat trip to New Orleans. So these farmers um, and store owners would get a flat boat. And that's pretty much what it sounds like. It's a flat boat. You have a little bitty shelter on it, and it's just packed full of goods. You sail it down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi to New Orleans, sell the goods, and then sell the boat, and then walk back home. That was the process. Well, Abraham Lincoln does this. He sails all the way down to New Orleans, and that's one of the biggest slave markets in the country. When he gets there, he sees the slave markets. He sees the humans being chained together, the horrible living conditions that they're in. 
And it's at that moment that Lincoln firmly becomes anti-slavery, and he carries that image with him the rest of his life, think of, knowing that humans should not be treated this way. And so we trace it. We trace it back to that flatboat trip. So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but you know, anti-slavery. But how anti-slavery was he? Because I mean, I've seen him say other things that maybe he wasn't as anti-slavery as what he put off. Um, you know, uh, comments. I mean, we, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, we can jump. We can jump a little ways up because um, okay. I think I know what you're referring to. He says, well, you know, once he becomes president, spoiler alert, he does become president. Um, he says that if I can, let me see if I can get the exact quote, but if I can save the union without freeing the slaves, I will. Um, but if I can free the, but if I can free the slaves and save the union uh, and save, save the union, I will. Um, it's all about saving the union. Well, we have to remember who he's saying that to. Um, and we still have to know that the country is the country ready for um, the, the federal government to step in and restrict these domestic institutions. So it's all about the context in which he says some of these things. I mean, because let's say that, uh, let's go ahead and just say South Carolina goes ahead and secedes. The rest of the South says, all right, let's, let's wait this through in articles. Does he move forward to? really you know uh, pushing um for abolition or does he kind of let things play out? probably not um in okay. all honesty if um the war kind of brings that about um, lincoln is anti-slavery but he's also a very strict constitutionalist he knows that the constitution protects the institution of slavery he knows he has no ability to change that Mm -hmm. um, he knows if he knows if it's going to change, it's got to come through Congress. It's got to be done internally. And so uh, we see that throughout his lifetime. Uh, he's very legally minded when it comes to slavery. He doesn't like it, but he does know it's protected. And so if the war does not give him the opportunity to end it, then he's probably not going to be doing it. He does not have that right. OK, let me ask you another question that I brought up to people. Um, uh, get your opinion on they'll save the union it sounds no i mean uh you know we want to protect the union how much did, did this go into and maybe it does play out with, with when you think about both sides uh that yeah he wanted to save the union but how much else does it play into it that some of it may have been ego that hey you lost this election now i'm the president you're not going to do whatever the hell you want to do Can you reword that? I think I know what oh, you're meaning. Yeah, like, okay. Um, being, um, you know, he said, we're out to save the union, which sounds noble uh, on it, on the whole. But, you know, how much did this come down to that, you know, just because the South, uh, uh, lot, you know, they lost this election and withdrew, then Lincoln decides to, you know, enforce, um, you know, was he really out to save the union or was it really out to impose his will as president? Okay. Um, Eric Foner probably is. Yeah, that, that makes more sense. Eric Foner, the, he's a wonderful historian and probably one of the best Lincoln scholars out there. Um, I, well, sorry, take might not be Eric Foner. Um, Alan Gelzo, I think it's Alan Gelzo, he, another, another Lincoln scholar who believes that his, in, his entire intention was to end slavery with his presidency. Okay. Um, some historians take that route. That's kind of a fringe idea, I do believe. Most historians with the or have the consensus that Abraham Lincoln is not going to be doing that. Um, it's the war that provides that opportunity. It's initially, it's to save the Union. It evolves into something different, but initially, that is his entire intention. He's president of the United States, he, and he had, intends to be the president of all of the United States. So you think that kind of goes hand in hand that he is the president? I'm going to save the union. And you're not going to leave just because you lost, just because you want to. I mean, because I've asked this to people like, well, like, what if Breckenridge had won and the you know the Northeast would have seceded? You think Breckenridge would have said, "No, you're not leaving"? That I couldn't say. I, I really yeah. don't know if. Breckenridge would have 
what Breckenridge would have done. Uh, Lincoln said that the uh, secession itself was an attack on popular government. And we okay. see this, ex this same exact um, rhetoric in the Gettysburg Address. Just because you do not like the president does not give you the right to leave. We, okay. have, in, we have a process that in four years you can you can re vote this person out. So you got four years to convince everybody that this person's no good. But just because you lose an election does not give you the right to li to leave the union. That's Lincoln's mentality: is that the secession, what the South did, was an attack on popular government and the government institution that the founders put forward. Okay, that's a good that's a good explanation. Good explanation for it. So, any Sorry, any other questions? <laughs> uh, no, I was just you know the the whole um. You know, the argument I listen to people go back and forth, the constitutionality of it and um, everything is so um, – I've, I've always loved the argument, you know, was the, did the South have the right to see, you know, what, what was really going here? Because there's really no, um, you know, no prep, uh, basis for it because, you know, the – what uh, section or clause is it gives the states a, how to enter, but it doesn't say anything about, you know, leaving. I think it was what Texas versus White was finally settled, if I'm not correct. But no, I'm sorry. I got you off target there, but um, that's all I got for right oh, now. No, it's all right. Uh, Abraham Lincoln does walk a fine line with constitutionality, and we can talk about some of that um, as we're going through the, the war years when he becomes president. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but let's uh, – Let's at least get him into politics because I think his yeah. uh, initial forays into politics are pretty interesting in that it's not very eventful. Uh, he His family moves from Indiana to Illinois to New Salem. He becomes a store clerk, and it's here, being a store clerk, where he starts to uh, be able to converse with people, that he's able to um, – have these deep have these conversations and entertain people. He loved to tell stories, and so people came into the store just to hear Abraham Lincoln speak. And when he decides to, he gains a pretty good reputation in New Salem. He even is a what I like to call professional wrestler. He does wrestle. Um, he wrestles really? the leader of a gang. Yeah, he wrestles the leader of a gang in New Salem. And uh, depending on which story you listen to, he wins. But he gains a really good reputation, and he actually runs for a legislative position. Mm -hmm. He loses to be a state legislator. He loses, but he realized that where everybody knew him, he actually won a great deal of the votes. So that actually prompted him, if people know me, they like me, and they're going to vote for me. And so this gives him more um, – more reason to keep going deeper into politics because he is liked this much. And so while he's in New Salem, he does decide to become a lawyer. His, uh, he'll study uh, the, the law under John T. Stewart, and he loves to ride the circuit. And what that means is we're, tying up, we're accustomed to today where a court is at the county seat. Mm -hmm. um, and you just go to court whenever your uh, whenever your court case is, <laughs> or your court hearing is. Uh -huh. Well, well, back then, the judge and ever so many lawyers would actually travel around to each town, set up shop in a some kind of public building for a couple weeks, and then hear all the cases for that town, and then move to the next one and just do that. And that's called riding the circuit. And okay. So Abraham Lincoln loved doing this. That was some of his most fun times. There's a lot of camaraderie because all the lawyers know one another, all the judges know one another, and you're just – you're basically uh, debating friends to some extent. And uh, he does a really good job of being a lawyer, um, but he's still wanting to get into politics. Um, in between all of this, he becomes – he does get on the state legislature, and it's while he's running for the state – or while he's a state legislator that he finds out um, – well – he runs on the Whig ticket. He's always he's always been a Whig. Um, the, he's had I like telling my students he has a man crush on the founder of the Whig Party, Henry Clay, the uh, the great Kentuckian, <laughs> probably the greatest politician of the 19th century to never be president. And 
it's when he's a legislator that he becomes even more ingrained of being a legislator. And what I mean by or being a Whig, um, what I mean by that is the bank war happens the same time that he is in the state legislature. The bank war was when Andrew Jackson attacked the National Bank. Now, the National Bank was supposed to regulate all the banking systems within the United States. It got it got corrupt, like many things can. Um, it's not a bad idea, but it was bad because of um, who was in there running it. And Andrew Jackson destroys the National Bank. Well, that's where all the money for Abraham Lincoln state legislative funding for internal improvements was coming from was from national getting loans from the National Bank to help the state of Illinois. That falls through because of the bank war, and this makes him new, do not like to not like the Democrats and specifically Andrew Jackson. So he firmly becomes a Whig, and he's never going to cross that line. Okay, but um, so. He becomes a uh, he's he's doing he is in the legislature for a little while. He is a circuit uh, circuit lawyer. He eventually runs for Congress, and he serves one year as co in Congress or one year one term in Congress. Not much uh, does he he doesn't do too much in Congress. Uh, the Mexican American War is actually taking place while he's in Congress. He's part of the Spot Resolution. So the basically the Mexican-American War was contrived. The federal government um, Ill illegally invaded Mexico because Mexico believed that their border was the Nueces River with Texas and the United mm -hmm. States believed it was the Rio Grande. So when mm -hmm. Polk sent when uh, President Polk sent the troops over the Nueces River, technically they have invaded from the point of view of the Mexican of uh, the Mexican government. Um, it's also said that American blood was shed on American soil because Mexican troops came over the border. Lincoln and some of these other politicians are the ones that deliver the spot resolution saying, show me the spot where American blood was shed to show that this was a just war. Oh, wow. um, even, yeah, even Ulysses S. Grant will say this was an unjust war. and He fought in it. Um, it but it was Abraham Lincoln that said it was trying to um, def defend, uh, well, I say defend Mexico, but defend the unjust, uh, try to show how unjust this war actually was with Mexico. Seems so, like we've had a history of those. <laughs> say that again. Seems like we've had a history of those types of things with American people, <laughs> or American government. No, no comment. Um, <laughs> The uh, so his time in Congress, like I said, was it was one term as as a congressman, and he the Mexican American War kind of surrounded that. He did a few small things, but nothing very large. So so far, he's just been a state legislator, and he's been a congressman for one term. Pretty lackluster. He comes out of Congress. He actually goes into a depression. He is prone to depression. It's called melancholy back then. We think he was a manic depressant, depending on from when historians kind of go through his letters and try to understand him better. He may have been a manic depressant. And when he comes out of Congress, he's left that camaraderie that he had so enjoyed. It was very, uh, what you want to say, kind of a manly atmosphere around Washington, D.C. You uh, lived with these men that you went to Congress with. You uh, ate dinner with them, you ate breakfast, lunch and dinner with them, you went to Congress and you voted with them, and then you went and did the whole thing over again. So it was very, uh, very good camaraderie in Congress. You knew everybody there. <laughs> hey, and um, so, let me go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure. Let me get this 900 pound grill out of the room because you brought this up a few times. Uh, uh, well, um, but you said the last thing about man. What's the, what's the truth to the rumors of Lincoln's sexuality? I have no earthly idea of – there's been some historians that have uh, uh, speculated, I guess is the best way to say it, that um, – but – and it comes from him having to share rooms with uh, lawyers and judges right. while he's writing the circuit court. Everybody did that. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you go to a town and uh, – you usually didn't have a what's called a hotel. 
you would have a tavern. And a tavern worked as a few different things. A tavern was not just a place you got to drink alcohol. It was also a restaurant. It was a community center for people to meet at. It was sometimes a makeshift store, and it was kind of a hotel. Now, the hotel part of it was simply there might be one or two rooms where 20 people sleep in this one room. Wow. And so, yeah, it's it, that's where some of those rumors came from. And okay. I say that that's what everybody did. If you traveled at all, you were going to be in a tavern at some point in your life, sleeping in the same room with a couple dozen people sometimes. So right. that's the that's where it comes from. I don't think there's enough evidence to speculate either way. So hopefully yeah, that answers. Like, yeah, I mean, there's uh, you know, there's a uh, you know, Buchanan King letters. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever read any of those, but no, I know what you're talking I about. I've heard of it. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I don't think I've heard of what you was referring to. We, uh, James Buchanan and William Rufus King. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. I was. Yeah. You just said Buchanan King, and I was. Oh, sorry. I should have. Um. Yeah. Made a. a yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Half an A there. Put them in there. But yeah. Yeah. That's what I've always thought. There was just really nothing overwhelming in that. But sorry, I didn't mean to take you off a of course oh. there. But. Oh, that's why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, once he comes back from Congress, though, he, like I said, he goes into a depression because that camaraderie is gone. Uh, he does he does find solace in riding the circuit again, uh, but then he he kind of he comes into his own and becomes a corporate lawyer. Um, uh, he is representing he is the corporate lawyer for railroads in the state of Illinois, and he becomes state and regionally famous for being a lawyer. Uh, representing big big clients uh, one of his biggest court cases and I'll just mention this one just because it's uh, probably the, one of the more famous ones that he's ahead of is it's the Illinois Central Railroad versus the county of McLean uh, railroads when they move through an area become the biggest landowners in counties and in states they just own so much land because they have to run tracks on their own land these Counties and states will say, all right, you don't have to pay taxes because you own so much land and you're bringing so much revenue into the state. That's the mentality. We still see that today with companies and states doing things like that. Well, the county of McLean doesn't is not making much money, and here is the largest landowner in the county not paying any taxes. And so they sue for, ta for the tax money they should have gotten against the Illinois Central Railroad. Abraham Lincoln defends the Illinois Central Railroad and wins the case for them. Um, Lincoln actually faces his two previous law partners, uh, Lo uh, John T. Stewart and uh, John Logan. Uh, they, are the, they are the opposition, so that's the teacher versus the student at this point. And he wins, and he charges them $5,000 for, for oh, his wow. duties. The funny thing about that is the Illinois Central Railroad refuses to pay him. And so oh. he has to he has to countersue them for the money that they owe him. And the way he defends himself is that, hey, I've saved you $500,000 roughly in taxes. The least you can do is pay me $5,000. And the best way I can explain it, $5,000 back then is kind of a middle to upper class household annual income. Mm. So that's really good money. And he's winning that in one court case. But he does. Not only does he win the court case against the county of McLean for the Illinois Central Railroad, he also wins his countersuit against the Illinois Central Railroad. So, I mean, he's a good, good lawyer. Okay. Now, now, uh, he comes back into politics. He is, uh, nationally, what's happening is the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Mm -hmm. Now, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and I like uh, using the kind of uh, fun language, it compromises the Missouri Compromise for <laughs> years. For about 30 years, the Missouri Compromise line divided the country saying slavery cannot exist above this line. That's how it's that's been for 30 years. That's what they set up. And then the Kansas-Nebraska Act comes in, 
and says that, well, it can exist above that line uh, as long as the people vote for it. So that's popular sovereignty. This freaks Abraham Lincoln out because that means that any of these new territories that are becoming states can become free no matter where they're at. at while the Missouri Compromise line was in, in effect, slavery was limited. Now it's unlimited. This is what scares Abraham Lincoln and brings him back into politics. Uh, he will go around the state of Illinois supporting uh, Republican candidates because now the Republican Party has developed at this point. He'll transfer from being a Whig, which kind of dies out, and the Republican Party uh, becomes the uh, kind of the lineage, the descendant of the Whig Party, it and the know-nothings. And he'll he'll go around and campaigning, and it's during 1858 when he runs against Stephen Douglas in the Illinois uh, Illinois Senate election, and this is where Lincoln becomes nationally famous. The Lincoln Douglas debates. They go around debating one another, and these debates get topped out and printed up, and they are distributed all over the country. People hear about Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas, and they understand Lincoln's a very direct and easily understood person. And when people read these pamphlets, they understand his platform, they understand what he's where he's coming from, and he gains national attention. He loses that election, but he gains national fame because of it. Now, let me ask you a question about these debates for um, sure. another. Uh, you know, we've heard of how famous they were, and you know, it was un, you know, unscripted, and you know, just uh, nobody interrupting. But was it like that, or was it like Douglas was going around campaigning, and Lincoln just kept showing up where he was and talking until Douglas was kind of forced to debate him? That's exactly what happens. He okay. basically follow. He basically follows him around, okay. and when Doug, Douglas has a big crowd, and before they disperse, Lincoln jumps up on stage and delivers his. That is to get him to debate Douglas. Ah, once, okay. once they have once once Douglas gets tired of that happening, then he will um, uh, accept a debate with Abraham Lincoln. Okay, and there was what seven of those. Uh, yes, I believe seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he become it gets national fame, and another address that people don't hear about a whole lot. Um, many of his speeches are quoted, but uh, one that not many people know about, at least not the, just the general Civil War enthusiast, is the Cooper Union Address. Now, the Cooper Union Address, he, he gets invited to make a speech at Cooper Union in the in the state of New York. When he delivers that address, he gets uh, newspaper backing. We see this today when presidents uh, are nominated, and certain newspapers come out in favor of a president. It's, it's been going along for quite a long time. Abraham, the election of 1860 is no different. When Lincoln delivers his Cooper Union address, he become he gets newspaper backers saying, "Hey, we need to get this person as a candidate for the presidency." Now, again, he's held a state legislative position, and he's a one-term congressman. That's it. That's all the uh, political offices he's held. But it that is enough. The um, Lincoln-Douglas debates and the Cooper Union address was enough that when the Republican National Convention meet, they start throwing names into the hat. Um, two of the big names is William Seward and um, Sam and Chase, both of them mm -hmm. big Republicans. And they say, well, if I can't have William Seward or if I can't have Sam and Chase, I'll take Abraham Lincoln. So he's everybody's second choice. But, uh, and one question that's this. how he becomes president or that's how he becomes the, gets the nomination. I mean, but what about this story right here? Because I was watching this uh, program on race. I think it was race for the White House on CNN. That um, it was uh, pretty much a done deal. Seward was had the nomination, and as his uh, people stayed out, I think Boss Tweed was or was that his campaign manager's name? Um, anyway, I think he's from New York. Uh, <clears throat> the Seward people stayed out the night before the nominating uh, process and stayed out partying, and the next day had a huge band playing music as they walked through the convention 
Hall and was shocked when they arrived to find that the Lincoln people had printed up fake passes and had took most of their seats. Um, so when they went in there, uh, Seward didn't have the votes. And I, you know, I forgot how many it went until they finally got it to him. Are you from, have you ever heard that? It seems like I have, but I'm not sure how how much of it is. I, I would hate to speculate either way. Because um, mm-hmm. the way I've always taught it and the way that um, probably David Donald, one of the probably the preeminent Lincoln scholars, describes it is that Lincoln becomes everyone's second choice because it's hard to get people to agree on one candidate. Um, okay. I'm not sure. I'd have to do a little digging for that. Yeah, look up that, man, because I, I, I was, it was about two years ago when they was having this, I think it was Race for the White House or something, but that they've had that, and I, what, but Thurlow, not, well, I can't think of that guy's, Boss Tweet or Boss Thurlow or something to that. He was a party boss out of New York, and like I said, they stayed out. They said they stayed out all night drinking and partying and marched to the convention hall. And they said the Lincoln people got up the next morning and printed all these fake passes, delegate passes, and they took their seats. And when they went in there, which was supposed to be a nomination on the first ballot, he didn't have it. And I think Pennsylvania kept changing their uh, delegation, kept voting. And maybe the third or fourth uh, vote, Lincoln got it. And they said, you know, Seward's boss cried. He started crying when he didn't get the nomination. Um, you know, I like I said, we don't see any in. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, but um, yeah, check it out sometime. Well, Seward was a big politician and power broker politically, mm-hmm. um, and that's one reason Abraham Lincoln chooses him as the Secretary of State. Um, Secretary of State is basically the president's right hand man. Um, I put him, I put the Secretary of State as probably the second most powerful person in the country. Uh, just because they have so much uh, so much influence on the president and so much power within the federal government. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree so, he achu- so he chooses William Seward to be his secretary of state. Uh, Sam and Chase, the other big Republican that's in the Pro- Republican National Convention, um, becomes the secretary of the Treasury. And his uh, postmaster general is Montgomery Blair, one of the, you know, one of the first Republicans. Uh, and then... His uh, Secretary of War, Simon Cameron. Simon Cameron's actually, um, he's a very bit well-known politician, a pretty good power broker, but we find out he's very corrupt. And we can talk about him getting ousted out of the, out of the cabinet, but those are four of his big cabinet members. Um, he will get, uh, Simon Cameron will get replaced by Edwin Stanton. Now, while, uh, <clears throat> so Lincoln gets elected, and seven southern states leave the Union. We all know the story of uh, of that, so we won't ha- rehash the secession winner. Uh, and that's a discussion all to itself, all these states leaving the Union. However, uh, when Lincoln becomes president, so March 4th, 1861, the Confederacy has started to uh, take forts throughout the South and, and arsenals. And of course, Fort Sumter is one of these that has yet to be captured. Lincoln has two options. He can either resupply it or he can surrender it. Well, Lincoln's not going to surrender it. Um, So there is only actually one choice. He has to resupply it. They need supplies. So he sends a message to the South Carolina governor saying, I'm sending a ship. It's sim if it's if nothing's bothered, it's simply going to go down there, resupply and that's it. No new troops, no nothing. Before that ship can get there, uh, shots are fired on Fort Sumter. And that's when Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion. That goes into my next kind of next point is when Abraham Lincoln refers to the war. He Sometimes he does call it war, but he's very very meticulous attempt to not give the Confederacy any any legitimacy as being a nation. So the official title for this war is a rebellion. If you look, let me ask a question about something. Sure. I'm sorry. Uh, Was there someone was mentioned this the other day, and I said I don't really know. I said, but I'll find out. um, Somebody knows a lot more than I do. Uh, There was a fort or something. um, Somebody told me they said that this fort had been given back to South Carolina like 10 years before, and there was troops at another fort, and Lincoln had reoccupied that one. Do you, do you know anything about that? 
statement or that's I think you're referring to Fort Moultrie. Mm -hmm. uh, Fort Moultrie was where the for those Union soldiers were actually stationed and it's not as easily defendable from the, you know like the, the area where the because it's on a it's, well, it's right next to Isle of Palms. I can't remember what the what the island that it sits on. Um, it's easy to be attacked, and so they actually move from Fort, Mul Fort Moultrie to Fort Sumter, and that's okay. um, yeah. So it uh, they they have to reoccupy the Fort Sumter. Uh, it, was this it, was Fort Sumter now a state fort, or was it still up under federal uh, control? That I'm not sure about. I'm okay. I'm suspecting that it was still under federal control i don't see why yeah, it wouldn't somebody just yeah this is somebody that told you know threw it out there so they had the which said the federal government gave it to south carolina and in 1850 or 1851 i said you know i don't know i said i'll i'll find out or i'll ask them i'll try to get you an answer to this but i don't i don't know the answer to that question so uh i'm with you i don't know why it would be handed back over to us or why it'd be turned over to a state but um anyway that that sorry i didn't mean to Throw you off uh, there again. Oh, no problem. The so when Lincoln's trying to when this war is developing or this rebellion, as he would want it to be emphasized as being, uh, he's walking a fine line internationally and domestically. Again, he doesn't want it to be uh, seem like he's attacking another nation because then the Confederacy has a right for other nations to come in and help them out. If it's simply a rebellion. Um, the these other nations have less of an international legal right to come in and help or do or do what they're trying or that give them any kind of aid so lincoln refers to it always as a rebellion again he'll, he'll use war in some instances but he emphasizes this is a rebellion but he walks a fine line there one of the reasons is because he issues a blockade the anaconda plan you can't blockade yourself you can blockade another nation. So he's walking a fine line. Are, are, is the Confederacy a nation or not? Uh, another way he does this is prisoners of war. Um, if this is a rebellion and it's treason, he has a right to arrest and even execute these people. So he doesn't. He treats them as prisoners of war, as if these soldiers uh, are of a foreign nation. So there he's walking another fine line. One of the finest lines that happens within the first year of the war is the Mason and the, the Trent affair with Mason and Slidell, two diplomats that are going to England on on behalf of the Confederacy to help advocate for the Confederacy to become a nation or at least national uh, internationally recognized. The United States pull uh, captures this British vessel and arrests Mason and Slidell, nearly bringing on an international incident in a possible war with Great Britain. Um, even William Seward suggests, hey, maybe we can uh, start a war with Great Britain and the South will come back and join us because now we have a common enemy we can fight. Uh, Lincoln, of course, does not accept this good, for good reason, uh, but <laughs> he's, he walks a very fine line internationally and domestically within these first, you know, this first few months to even year of the war of how is this going to be defined? Uh, definition is extremely important in this respect. So uh, any questions? Um, didn't the king send like 25,000 troops to Montreal? After uh, Britain, <laughs> I always kind of laugh. Britain uh, technically stays neutral, but th they're anything but neutral during the war. <laughs> they, they, um, to some extent, the government of Great Britain is neutral, but people in Great Britain are not. Um, they, they're supplying the Confederacy and the Union with weapons, particularly the infield rifle, which the infield rifle was developed to fight the Russians in the Crimean War. And they are sending thousands of those to the Confederacy and the Union both. They're making ships for the Confederacy. So even though the Britain is supposed to be neutral, and to, the, to an extent the government is, um, the people of Great Britain are not. Well, why so are the people do. of Great Britain um, supportive of the Confederacy? You know, because they're against slavery. Is it 
money to be made or anti a lot of it's money okay a, a lot of it honestly a lot of it is money um war profiteers are an, are are ages old you'll never get mm-hmm. past past them uh war profiteers okay. are always going to be in existence and yeah so uh part of it is hey let's make some money part of it is because the south has cotton and britain needs uh cotton to, for their textile industry right but uh, they do go into uh, india to try to actually make cotton sustainable there and egypt and so by the time the civil war ends uh, britain does have a nice little in, uh, influx of cotton from Egypt and India, although it's not as good quality cotton as the South has. It didn't Lincoln have some kind of uh, quote there after that one war at a time or something to that effect? Yes, yes, it's, it's one war at a time, I do believe. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so when Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteers, this scares the Upper South, so that's Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, and they join the Confederacy. Now there's 11 states, and so Abraham Lincoln is in a unique situation because Washington, D.C. is surrounded by slave states, Virginia right. and, and Maryland, and so we talked about this a little bit earlier, but his constitutionality is put in question at this point because Union troops are trying to get to Washington, D.C., and Maryland citizens are sabotaging the roads, throwing you know throwing rocks or even worse things at uh, Union troops trying to get to Washington, D.C. And so he suspends the writ of habeas corpus. I'm always amazed that my students do not know what the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus does, but this prevents really? this, this prevents you uh, the writ of uh, the writ of habeas corpus prevents you from being arrested for for no for no reason. You have to have a mm-hmm. reason to be arrested. You can't be jailed uh, for no reason. Well, Lincoln suspends this writ. Um, only Congress can suspend the writ of habeas corpus, right. but Lincoln does it as president. Now, Congress will uphold that decision once Congress comes into session, but they're not in session at the moment that he does this. So he does run into some constitutionally illegal stuff, in this, er, especially in these early stages of the war. Uh, he fights uh, constitutionality the entire war, and again, that's probably another entire discussion. There are many books written on that, uh, but it is pretty much – uh, every president we've ever had has agreed that when a war is being sta- – when a war is going on, the president has more powers than he would have than if there wasn't a war. Um, we can look at – Thomas Jefferson says this. We can look at Andrew Jackson saying, saying that Abraham Lincoln, any president that has been involved in a war of some kind has expanded the presidential powers. And that's what kind of gets Lincoln off the hook in many people's eyes, although legally um, the Supreme Court actually does fight back against a lot of this. Uh, what makes it legal in a lot of people's eyes is simply the presidential war powers. Um, at Mississippi State, I took an entire class on presidential war powers, and we spent a great deal of time on President Abraham Lincoln. And again, he did some stuff that technically is illegal. He cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus as president, but because a war is in, because, because the nation is at, at risk, the president gets invested with more powers than if a war was not in not going on. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so this is the setup. Uh, the civil war, uh, the civil war is now erupting, and I love the early stages of the war with Abraham Lincoln because we see that there's a Confederate army within the summer of 1861. There is a Confederate army within 30 miles of Washington, D.C. What do you do? I mean, this is uh, as president, the country is literally breaking apart and falling apart, and there is an enemy army that's 30 miles away from you. What do you do? He sends in the troops, Irvin McDowell to put down this, and they lose. The the first battle of Bull Run is a Union defeat. This is, and and because of the two capitals 
the Confederacy and the Union's capital are in the east. Everybody's focus is on the Eastern theater. We see that part of it is uh, kind of the lost cause literature directs people more towards the Eastern theater. Uh, but people in their own time see the Eastern theater is more important. And so this is very uh, destructive to Abraham Lincoln and the war effort when he keeps seeing these losses and nothing's happening in the East. And so for the first Battle Bull Run is a very demoralizing aspect of Lincoln's life. He's having to, uh, he, let's put it this way, there's not a day that that man does not work. Um, every every day has been accounted for in Abraham Lincoln's life, and he's always doing something, whether it's uh, diplomatically with Congress and the Senate, or or something handling situations because it this is a full time job for the president during the Civil War. Um, did you have a question? I, I thought I heard you. Well, I was yeah. yeah, super. Thank you. You know, I, I hate to delve into these things like this. Uh, you know, I mean, with the roads backed up that day, I mean, they, they pursued. I mean, they could have destroyed McDowell. I mean, if they take the capital then and the government gets out, um, does does that end the war, or do they just regroup in Philadelphia? I had this conversation with um, another Lincoln scholar. Uh, I had him at uh, Lincoln Memorial University. Um, his name is Charles Hubbard probably one of the best professors I've ever had in my life. And I, if I remember correctly, what he said was Abraham Lincoln is never going to give up. If he can get okay. out of Washington, D.C., this war is going to continue on. He is that hard of a worker. Um, Not he, al he also believes intently and wholeheartedly in the preservation of the Union that this is um, this is the main goal. He is going to become president of all of the United States. And so um, if he can now if he gets captured, that's a different story. We don't uh, I'm not sure how it would go. What what the yeah, well, United States what would, would do. If, yeah, if the whole government gets captured or you know, even if somebody, you know, I don't know what would happen. No, but if but if just the capital was captured and a few politicians uh, and Lincoln is still going to prosecute this war. It's it's not going to end just because of that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's Abraham Lincoln's got that mentality. He's got a lot of ambition, and that's one reason that uh, Mary Todd was uh, attracted to him was because of his ambition. Uh, we didn't even talk about his married life. I guess the, now would be a pretty good time to talk about it. Uh, yeah, you can have the question uh, about the president's sure. race. Um, uh, <laughs> Did you know, because uh, I was looking at this, the guy told me this, and he's, I forgot to bring it up earlier, when you saw about, you know, Lincoln being liked. Um, and uh, the first time, it doesn't really surprise me, because, you know, um, Douglas was on the ticket. But he realized that he lost Illinois in 1860, uh, and that he lost his home county twice. And in 1860, in 1864, he only carried his city by six votes. The, the election of 1860 is um, a unique election because when you look at the presidential map, the, the election map, um, mm -hmm. you, you would not know that Stephen Douglas was second in the popular vote. Right. Um, Stephen Douglas, people like Stephen Douglas. Um, he's been a politician for quite a while. And he has been influential in all this. One reason Abraham Lincoln runs against him, not just because he was in the home state, but was because he was the man, who, one, of the, one of the men who came up with popular sovereignty, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which had done away with the Missouri Compromise. This was kind of personal to Abraham Lincoln. Um, they were even in the state legislature together. And it was Abraham Lincoln's wife, Mary, who had eyes for Stephen Douglas initially. She, she really? said that she was, yeah, she was going to be, she was said that she was going to marry the president of the United States. And at the time, <laughs> uh, at the time, Stephen Douglas was the rising politician. I mean, he was, I mean, he was, he was on his way. And so uh, Mary did, did want to marry uh, 
Stephen Douglas, but he kind of brushed her off and Abraham Lincoln got her. But she loved his ambition was one reason that uh, she liked Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was ambitious, and Mary Todd was a very political woman, which was uh, unique for the time period. You don't see don't women that, that are yeah, you didn't see you didn't see women that were that politically. Um, like an eighteen sixty Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I mean, she she was <laughs> yeah. extremely well. Uh, she knew what politics was going on. She and she could discuss politics, and she was a good conversationalist. Abraham Lincoln was very awkward around women, as most ah. of us can probably understand. He did; he wasn't very good at talking to women. Uh, but when he talked to Mary, he could talk to her about politics, which he knew a lot about. And plus, if he did kind of get lost in a conversation, Mary could come in and pick up the pieces and start start okay. the conversation at any location. So they were pretty a pretty good match. Uh, however. Uh, they did not have the best of relationship once they got married. Uh, before they got married, they actually they uh, they actually broke off their engagement at one point. And so, uh, and at one instance, uh, Mary was supposed to have uh, slapped Abraham Lincoln across the face with a piece of stove wood. Uh, another <laughs> uh, another instance was a neighbor watched out the back window and saw that. Um, Abraham Lincoln busts out the back door of his house, and Mary Todd is chasing after him with a butcher's knife. And once Lincoln that. sees that, uh, once Lincoln sees that it, someone's watching, he kind of, since he's a lot bigger than her and longer arms, he just grabs her by the arm and kind of walks her back into the house. Come on along, dear. Um, it's <laughs> a, uh, it's not a great relationship. Um, yeah. And Abraham Lincoln and Mary's not easy to get along with, but it's not entirely her fault. She had, uh, from what we understand, she had really bad allergies. And if anyone knows that what allergies are, it can be a miserable situation for you. And so she is irritable a lot, but she's in great pain for a lot of her life because mm -hmm. of these bad allergies and things. And so what Lincoln does is, you know, his way of dealing with his wife is he ignores her, which is not the right thing to do. No, of course. So uh, and but this is what makes the relationship very at some points it can be seen as very good. And at some points it can be it can be a complete nightmare. Um, and, and they lose two and they lose two sons. Yeah, and this, this is this is distressing about both to both of them. Um, before, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, they lose Eddie um, uh, it, when he's four years old, and uh, that's their first child that they lose. He was their second child, but the first one that they lose. And so she is in a lot of – she's under a lot of stress, and so is Abraham Lincoln. But again, Lincoln's way of dealing with it is Mary is uh, – just ignore her. Hopefully it will go away. Hey, um – let me uh, make something before I uh, forget. Um, we were talking about that election a while ago. I found something that was interesting when I was watching that uh, race for the White House, what it was. That um, Douglas spent a lot of time uh, campaigning in the South, uh, trying to take votes from Breckenridge, uh, which I found was interesting that um, he was allocating that kind of resources there. I figured it would be focusing on the North. And then one of the uh, neat things that uh, the hotel is still actually open. Uh, I sent a commercial on it not too long ago. Uh, it's one of the oldest in the South. There's a hotel in Mobile that Douglas spent the night of the election watching returns from. Um, I, just, you know, it's probably useless trivia there, but you know why he was spending that night in Mobile, Alabama is just a, uh, you know, an inter I guess an interesting tidbit to the race. Um, I, I don't know why he would been been there, but uh, just a fun fact. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, Catch you off there. I just wanted to bring that up before I, got, before I forgot it. Oh no, um, Stephen Douglas worked worked his tail off trying to get elected and trying to keep the country together. Could he have kept it together? Possibly the even though the Democratic Party split, the the South did trust him to a certain degree. And you can, like I said, he gets the second most popular votes, even though he win only wins one and a half states. He wins Missouri and half of New Jersey. Um, People did like him. Um, people re and people trusted him to be kind of fair. Why did the South split the Democratic Party again? Uh, I mean, because he was not going to abolish slavery. 
No, the they they have their first convention. The Democratic Party does, and they just cannot agree. The, okay. The, the, the and they say if we can't decide here, and so they split up. They have another conven- They have different conventions, and the southern ones put up Breckenridge. The northern ones put up Stephen Douglas. And okay. so it, they have a couple of conventions and, because the first one just ends in no one can decide. And okay. uh, Breckenridge is uh, Breckenridge is a safe bet for the Deep South. Um, he's a he's a slave owner. He is a strong Democrat. Uh, he's fairly young. He's vice president at the time, so he seems like a shoe in. But yeah. splitting the vote is not good. But if you look. Uh, even if uh, if Stephen Douglas had let's replace Stephen Douglas, uh, let's say that Breckenridge never went in. Stephen Douglas is the Democratic candidate. Mm-hmm. He can he can win all the South, including Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee, and Missouri, and half of New Jersey. He still can't beat Abraham Lincoln. Even um, there's a yeah, there, there's a great website where you can actually yeah, replay yeah, these elections. And I, I've done it with Abraham with the election of 1860 a bunch of times, and it uh, Stephen Douglas and uh, would have had to have made some headway into the Midwest to be able to have beat Abraham Lincoln. So even if you put all of Douglas Breckinridge and um, the Constitutional Union Party together with winning 60 percent of the polarity, they still wouldn't be have enough votes to overtake Lincoln in the other states. If, if I'm remembering correctly, the last time I did it, uh, it okay. still could not do it. As, right. And one reason is because the the southern states just don't have the populations that the northern states do. Yeah, and you know, if if I remember right too, uh, that would I, the polarity would not be that overwhelming because uh, I think Lincoln was only on Virginia in the south in the southern states on the ballot. Yeah, yeah. The many southern states did not have him even right. on the ballot, so you couldn't even vote mm-hmm. for him. Yeah, even if he okay. did, even if he did run. Yes, yeah, that even, even because he did run. Oh okay. no problem. Um, so let's kind of run through 1862. Um, 1862 is a uh, very pivotal year for Abraham Lincoln. Um, after the Seven Days Battle. I've actually got a video of the uh, coming up of this uh, fairly soon. Uh, after the Seven Days Campaign, we'll say uh, Seven Days Battles or the Seven Days Campaign, uh, Lincoln talks with his cabinet, and they agree to alter the Union policies toward Confederate property. Um, they ramp up the Confiscation Act in the second Confiscation Act. That means that Confederate property can be seized by federal authorities coming through. If you are disloyal, um, your, your property can be confiscated by the federal government, especially if it's used against the United States. Um, this is this is huge that the that the president of the United States and Congress are supporting this um, and pass this law, the Second Confiscation Act. This is a precursor just a few months later to the Emancipation Proclamation, because just a few days after the seven days campaign ends, Abraham Lincoln talks with his cabinet also about the uh, issue and an emancipation proclamation. The proclamation has a couple of reasons of why he's actually doing this emancipation proclamation. Um, one is that the South is using slaves for the war effort. They're right. using them to uh, dig fortifications. They're using them to work in factories, to grow cotton, all supplying towards the Confederate war effort. Fighting an army. If, uh, well, <laughs> no. Sorry, I had to make that joke. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I'll edit and, that. I had to, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> um, and so the Emancipation Proclamation would if work could get out that the Emancipation Proclamation was in effect. Now Lincoln knows that the South is not going to. Uh, he's hoping that they will join the Union because when he delivers the preliminary Emancipa- uh, Pre- Emancipation Proclamation after the um, Battle of Antietam, he gives them the ultimatum. Hey, you can either join the Union 
and nothing will ever be done about slavery. You can still keep it. However, you've got until January 1st, 1863. Now, does Lincoln think it's going to happen? He hopes. It'll be good. It'll be nice. But um, what he's hoping for is when that goes into effect, word's going to spread to slaves. And they're going to run to Union lines. And this is going to take away the Confederate war effort, the, the manpower of the Confederate war effort. Not only is it going to do that, but the Emancipation Proclamation does another thing, which people don't uh, conceptualize when they think of the proclamation. It also allows African-American males to join the army. That's a huge part mm. of the Emancipation Proclamation. Not only can they go into Union lines, but now they can join the army, and it's only going to boost the manpower of the United States Army. And so it's twofold that he's hoping this Emancipation Proclamation will help the Union win it even sooner. And so when he says this is a war measure, it definitely is. It's part of his entire mentality. He doesn't like slavery. Sl slavery is now vulnerable. It can be destroyed. And because it was you know, this big reason for the South to leave, that's why they say that they leave. Uh, South Carolina says, you, we are leaving the Union because you are threatening the domestic institutions we have. That's uh, and slavery, uh, the slavery. So it's going to happen again. The Civil War is going to happen again if slavery is not dealt with. That issue is not dealt with. And so that's his intention with the Emancipation Proclamation. He didn't like it. It wasn't his intention to do away with it. He knew he had... Uh, he knew he didn't have any leg to stand on constitutionally to do it. However, when a war is on, the presidential war powers expand. That's why we talked about this earlier. That's why I made sure I talked about it earlier. When the president is during wartime, the powers expand. Thus, he is able to legally issue that proclamation. Okay. Uh, now, once the Emancipation Proclamation, or at least the preliminary one, is done in September, in December we know the Battle of Fredericksburg takes place. And Lincoln says, my God, my God, what will the country say? So many Union casualties and very few Confederate comparatively. This is, I mean, this is not looking good. Holy crap, I've just stepped on, on a limb here in the mind of Abraham Lincoln and issued this proclamation, and now we can't even get a victory in the East. Uh, but uh, December 31st and into January 2nd of 1863, uh, the Battle of Stones River takes place. It's a Union victory. Lincoln loves this. This builds up Lincoln's morale that this is the first Union victory since the Emancipation Proclamation. Of course, no southern state has came back into the Union by January 1st, it, uh, but now Lincoln has that edge on the Confederacy. Now slaves can run into Union lines and now we can arm them and we can use them for this war effort. So Stones River takes place, first Union victory since the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation and since the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. Uh, Lincoln is grasping for commanders in the East. He's had Burnside, he replaces Burnside with Hooker. Hooker gets replaced after Chancellorsville where the Union lose another horrible battle, one of Lee's greatest victories at Chancellorsville. He finally puts in George Meade, and by the time Gettysburg rolls around, I always tell people I don't. I never liked people saying that Gettysburg was a turning point. I believe that 1863 was a turning point. I think that's a better way of putting it. Uh, Gettysburg, yes, it stops Lee's invasion, but it doesn't destroy that army. It just simply gives because not only are the people in the United States focused on the Eastern theater internationally, people are concentrating on the Eastern theater. So we get when Great Britain and France are looking at the war, when Gettysburg is a victory, that is a that's actually better diplomatically for the country than it is for the actual country. I like to put it kind of describe it about, like that. I'm sorry. When they talk about Gettysburg and the turning point and the casualties, like, yeah, you know, Lee suffered, you know, 22, 23,000 casualties. And like, but that didn't, you know, it was a tremendous loss. But, you know, those casualties didn't prevent them from waging war for two more years, you know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
you know, it didn't and just so, stop off as warfare. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, it, I, I, was com- I completely agree. And but the next day is Vicksburg, uh, mm-hmm. an extremely, an extremely great strategic victory for the nation <laughs> itself. Um, it cuts off. Now the Mississippi River is completely dominated by the Union. Once we get into, uh, then we get um, Chickamauga in September. The Union, even though they lose Chickamauga, they have gained Chattanooga. Chattanooga is this railroad hub that everybody focuses on. Uh, the South does at least because it connects the Eastern and Western Confederacies by the East Tennessee Virginia Railroad that runs from Knoxville, Tennessee to Richmond, Virginia. When it's taken, that that's the big nail in the coffin. You know, here, here you've got Gettysburg, you've got Vicksburg, but I have always been of been of the um, been of the mentality that Chattanooga, when it was captured by Union forces in uh, late August, early September of 1863, that was the nail in the coffin. That was the turning point because the Confederacy is not able to regain that that railroad hub. And that is probably one of Lincoln's greatest victories is even though it's a defeat at Chickamauga, it's a victory strategically for the Union capturing Chattanooga. Um, I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that or not. Uh, being a, well, yeah, yeah, I was, you know, uh, that as far as that, what, the Tula Homi campaign or how they refer to that? I mean, that gets overlooked. That's probably more important, I mean, in my eyes, than Vicksburg and Gettysburg. I I completely agree. Uh, the Tullahoma campaign and going into Chattanooga. When you look at the resources that are depriving the Confederacy, that's the turning point. And yeah. uh, and I'll I'll broaden it. I'll even uh, relent some. It's the entire year of 1863 that is a turning point. But I don't think you can say Gettysburg is. A turning point. I have a better, I have an easier time believing that Vicksburg is a turning point as opposed to Gettysburg. Okay. But either way, that's, I'm off on my tangent there. Uh, when, <laughs> uh, when Vicksburg is taken, uh, that's a pivotal moment in Abraham Lincoln's mentality towards Grant. Uh, Lincoln will say, Grant is my man and I am his. He, uh, at that point, Lincoln knows that there is one man that has won him victories uh, constantly, and that's Ulysses S. Grant. And so Vicksburg, as another t- part of its turning point mentality, uh, turning point, another aspect of that turning point is that it solidifies Grant as L- Lincoln's commander, and that's what facilitates Lincoln to bring him to um, to the east and to make him commander of all Union forces. But in 1864, with Grant in command, uh, uh, well, in the East, he, he's command all over, but when he's commanding the Eastern Army and Sherman is commanded in the West, going towards Atlanta, uh, it's some extremely bloody campaigns. Um, Lincoln's grieved at this. Um, he, he hates that all this bloodshed is having to happen, but uh, I think he understands that Grant has to do what he has to do. Grant's a wonderful strategist. I don't know. Uh, he gets a horrible reputation, mostly because of lost cause literature that portrayed him as a butcher. But he's a great strategist. You only have to look so far as the Vicksburg campaign to see his his genius and his ability to use technology to win battles. Uh, he simply had to slug it out with Lee. Um, and these bloody campaigns grieved Abraham Lincoln because he, he he's getting in all these reports of so many casualties. Uh, But when Atlanta was captured, that's a pivotal moment in the election of 1864. Lincoln's up for election. Anything can happen. He's running against the the general that he had uh, removed a couple of times, George B. McClellan. And when Atlanta is captured in September, that's the September surprise that the war is going in a in a direction that the country is comfortable with Abraham Lincoln's leadership. And one thing that comes out of this, and I'll, I'll let you uh, jump in oh, here. And, uh, in So September, Atlanta is captured. In November, when the election actually takes place, soldiers are able to vote for the first time in the field. 
most union states, I think there's one, maybe two, that do not allow soldiers to vote in the field. They actually have to vote in person. Mm -hmm. When the when those votes get calculated, it's an overwhelming majority for Abraham Lincoln. That says something to Abraham Lincoln that the troops respect his decisions. This may be a very bloody campaign in for Richmond and for Atlanta, but guess what? They trust Abraham Lincoln, and that's a and that's another pivotal moment in Abraham Lincoln's life. Yeah, that's you know that was that says a lot right there. I mean, because especially how uh, beloved uh, McClellan supposedly was by his troops. But uh, you know, talking about that um, uh, capturing it. Atlanta in September and changing the race. And, you know, this is before um, Gallup and, you know, polls and stuff like that. And the perception, you know, sometimes perception is reality and sometimes it's not. I mean, was Lincoln ever really in doubt of losing this race or is it just a myth that's been uh, perpetuated that, you know, he was behind in the polls and he needed to come back. And if it hadn't been for Atlanta, he would have lost to McClellan and um, that would have changed the war because, you know, when you get even when you dig deeper into the Democratic platform, uh, McClellan never said he was going to stop the war. He just said he was going to prosecute it better. Um, and I pointed out to people about this. Uh, you know, if Lincoln does lose, then you know he doesn't leave office till zero four March eighteen sixty five. At that point, it would have been like the Allies making peace with Nazi Germany. I mean. I think Little Mac would have taken the oath of office in full military uniform and been on the first train to Petersburg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do believe, uh, I think the way you uh, describe the question, uh, I think it, me and you kind of think the same the way about the situation. Okay. Uh, that I'm not convinced that Abraham Lincoln would have lost 1860, uh, lost the election in 1864 if he mm -hmm. hadn't got Atlanta. I'm not convinced that he would have lost it because of that. Um, sim simply because I, we just don't have enough evidence to support that. Could that be the case? Yeah. Absolutely, but we don't have enough evidence to, to support that decision. Um, people make those claims, and to some extent, I I touch on it. Um, I mean, I just touched on it here that Atlanta captured. It was influential, no mm -hmm. doubt. However, I'm not convinced that it was the turning point in the election that some people give it credit for. Right. Yeah. Now, but, as far as um, – I'm sorry, the rest of that, uh, what do you think? If, if he does, you think little Mac's going to uh, end it or he's going to be out there? You know, I'm, I'm thinking he's, he may even take the oath of office at you know, Petersburg. <laughs> yeah, he, he can't end it. Um, I mean, he's, he's – um, you know, he first absolutely of all, can't. He, he, in, even if he wanted to. I mean, this guy's a military man. He sees the writing on the wall. I mean, and his ego, so he's going. He wants that victory. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. And wouldn't it be wonderful for him to have ended the Civil War? Yeah, uh, I think he's, I think he's enough of a narcissist to believe that and uh, of course. Uh, and go for that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I didn't uh, kind of got off point there again with you, but uh, no, those are fun tangents. I like those. <laughs> yeah, I do too. And so uh, once we get into 1865, of course, Lincoln's not long for this world, but uh, he is able to help get the 13th Amendment passed. Um, and he kind of, he wants the southern states to come, for to come back into the Union, they're going to have to accept the, all the anti-slavery laws that's been passed during the Civil War. That's that's the uh, price of admission back into the union. You have to join. You have to obey all these laws that we have set in place. So this, and because they'd have no political power otherwise, that's going to make them more likely to actually join the union, uh, rejoin the union. Uh, one thing I do, oh, the last thing I kind of want to talk about here that I've uh, written down is the Freedmen's Bureau. Mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln creates this uh, during the wartime in order to help this transition. There are 4 million people going to be, that are going to be freed. And these 4 million people that are going to be freed are going to be entering a new world, essentially. This is a world yeah. they're not, that many of them are not used to. Uh, many of them don't have some basic skills that you need in order to survive in the world, which is uh, simply reading and writing. And so the Freedmen's Bureau is, is uh, one of its biggest accomplishments, even though it doesn't have to the 
that doesn't have a large scale accomplishment, but it does have accomplishments. One of those is that they are able to build schools and help ex-slaves, both adults and children, to read and write. Um, they also kind of step in in legal situations in order to help them uh, navigate the, le the sign and legal documents for employment. Because after the war, we're going to see um, horribly, you know, people getting taken advantage of because mm -hmm. of legal documents that say that basically puts them back as slaves. And right. so uh, the Freedmen's Bureau is designed to try to help mitigate any of that, try to stop any of the coercion or anything that would harm the the now freed person. And so this is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't get much funding in Congress eventually, and it just kind of withers away. But uh, Lincoln uh, selects Oliver Otis Howard to kind of head to head up the Freedmen's Bureau, and Oliver Otis Howard gets a lot of bad bad reputation because of he he wasn't the greatest of commanders. Um, seems like when you get sent west, you get to become a better commander. That's what happened with Burnside. But Oliver Otis Howard is in charge of the Freedmen's Bureau, um, but because of lack of funding, it just kind of withers away. But it had good intentions, and I think, um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the Emancipation Proclamation is that uh, what are you going to do once these people are freed? You've got to help them out as much as possible. Uh, um, yeah, I've listened to uh, Shelby Foote one time. Uh, he was talking about, how, you know, the great slavery was one of the biggest sins. On the United States, and then he said how they handled the after the war afterwards with slaves. You know, was the second because they basically just left these people out there. If Lincoln doesn't get killed, I mean, how, is is he able to um, bridge this gap, so to speak, and create better harmony, or, or is it still going to be the same? Yes, um, I, I do think that if Abraham Lincoln would have survived the the transition for both uh, ex-slaves and for the South to rejoin the Union would have been a lot more smoother. Mm. It would have been a lot smoother uh, simply because Abraham Lincoln felt for the South. And for a long time during the war, Lincoln believed that the entire South was not against him. He believed that a lot of these people had been coerced and made to fight and that they didn't want to. Not all these people are for secession. Um, to a certain degree, he was right. Um, there's lots of anti-secession and lots of anti-Southerners in the South at, at the during during the war. Uh, it's not as to a degree that he thought it was, um, but he felt for the South, and he also knew. And this is probably one of the most beautiful things: is that if he punished the South. It was going to be harder to bring the country back together, and that was his ultimate goal: is let's bring the country back together. If you if you try to if you try to punish them, and you create bad blood, it's not going to happen. And it yeah. did create bad blood, and it did make it a lot tougher to rejoin ever for everybody to rejoin. Yeah, I have a friend who's good uh, from my Canada and was discussed this one night, and uh, he made this. <laughs> he said something about um. It should have been <clears throat> tougher for the South to, to be let back in. I said, let back in. I said, don't you mean forced back in by the bayonet? And I said, you know, what, what would happen if you'd have hung all these Southern leaders? I said, you know what that's going to do then? And I said, this thing might still be going on today if you would have hung Lee and uh, Davis and uh, Stevens and Longstreet. I said, that was the best thing what he did was, you know, trying to, it, it, you know, like you said, create harmony. Yeah, he, he said, uh, with malice toward none and charity for all, that was his intention, was let's bring the country back together. We, that was our task, to bring the country back together, and we're going to do that. Uh, now, of course, you need to um, need to come in without slavery now, but other than that, we welcome you back in with open arms. And so uh, I think that's probably the most beautiful part of Abraham Lincoln and his mentality towards the Civil War itself was um, – we're going to fight it very, very stubbornly. But once the war is over, it's over. No more, no more violence. I mean, Davis would have never been jailed for two years if you know, Lincoln had not been um, killed. Um, 
I would love to have known what he would have done. I think uh, I have no way to back this up, but I think that Abraham Lincoln would have had a conference with him, would have talked with him. Um, maybe not initially, but sometime in the later. And wouldn't that have been a wonderful conversation to have sat in on? You know, let's say 10, 15 years after the war, the president of the Confederacy and the president of the United States sit down and talk about the war. I think that would be one of the most amazing things that they could have possibly done. You think I don't Davis know if it would turn out well. <laughs> I think they. I think he would. Uh, Lincoln uh, Davis was a longtime politician. People knew him all over. Uh, he was a senator. He was the Secretary of War. He had done a little bit of everything in politics, and he's enough of a diplomat. I think he would have. I might be wrong, but I, I think. I mean, I think yeah, would that would have been. I mean, I, uh, yeah, that would have been something I'd love to sit on. I mean, like, uh, the, I used this that picture is for my moderator team of um, uh, Lee and Johnson sitting there. And, you know, I was like, I'd love to have sat in on that conversation. Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, just hearing these war stories, or I, I, that's what I, one thing I love to do is uh, simply listen to old soldiers talk about war reminiscences and it doesn't have to be even war, the actual war part so them talking about daily life as a soldier well, is fascinating to me um, that's <laughs> one reason I, one thing i love to do is just go to archives and read through journals and see what what they're doing and these those small simple stories are sometimes the most beautiful i have there, there's one soldier that i read um, i was going through his journal and i was reading every single day what he was doing and he would fish in the Cumberland River you know, just not too far from my house here he fished in the Cumberland River and he uh, he was stationed at Cumberland Gap and every night uh, well every evening he would go out and pick blackberries he'd make himself kind of a little blackberry cobbler every night uh, and just the, the sweetest stories and um, he got sick at one point started writing in his journal how how horribly sick he was and they said, I think I'm getting better. And then the next page is someone else's writing saying so-and-so passed away on this date. I'm sending oh. this to the family. And it, it just breaks your heart because you have followed this person from, I think he was from northern Kentucky. He was a Union soldier. You followed him all the way to Cumberland Gap, hundreds of miles from his home. And you, you, you think you're his friend almost because you've you've gotten so invested in his life. And it's just that's that's the part of the war I love to show people and hopefully on my channel I do that uh, because I do a lot of military stuff but I also do a lot of just regular regular yeah, army like life stuff because yeah. yeah I've got a thing where it's called warrior Wednesday or whatever and I try to challenge people who post like you know I know all the or well I you know know all love all the stories with Grant and Sherman and Lee and Jackson and, Long, and those guys but we hear all that I said go find me something about a, a, a corporal or a sergeant you know, lieutenant tell me tell me their story <laughs> you know tell me tell me what this guy's thinking you know uh, and, we, and that's exactly the what the uh, that's a, sorry to interrupt you but this no, is fine. uh what you what you just described is what 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 social historians have tried to make um, military historians do um, mm -hmm. For for the longest time, military historians will, took a very top down approach, where you hear about the generals, you hear about the commanders, and you don't hear much about the lower rungs of the army. Um, that changed in about the '90s, early 2000s, with uh, scholars and particularly social historians. They said we need to understand army life. We need to understand not just these generals and what their mentality was because these armies are made up of individuals that have individual experiences right. and they are unique to that regiment or that company and you can actually find out neat stories about the war and explain parts of the war better by talking about an individual soldier or individual company rather than you can talk about in a whole army sometimes. Yeah, it yeah. takes that level of detail, and I love that you brought that up. And I tell them, you know, to you know, go find me if you want to an officer. That's fine. Go find me an after action report from a company commander. You know, let me let me know what you know. This guy's right up here in the, you know, in the thick of. It. Go tell me what he's saying. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I have I have those all over my channel of especially Pickett's Charge. If, if and you listen to if you listen to just the regular private or a, a company officer 
or a colonel talking about uh, the picket's charge, that changed your entire mentality about the yeah. attack. Oh, t- totally. I mean, so if you, you know, people look on there on Wednesday, yeah, I mean, you'll find all kind of stuff that I've, that I've gone there and I'll look and find out, okay, this guy's from, I had stuff on there, follow this guy, was, uh, I think he was a lieutenant here from Alabama, you know, there's all this, you know, long story about it. And I was like, yeah, that's the stuff I want to hear about. And I'm glad they've, um, I think it's, other people have enjoyed it too. I mean, uh, I know I, I enjoy reading it, um, you know, but I guess some of them are still always going to be focused on the big guys, but, you know, so that I think that's more at least it's very interesting to me. It makes it more personal, I guess, if that makes sense. It does, it, it, and it makes it more more real to you because you can identify with them, with those right. regular soldiers. It's hard to identify with a general on a battlefield. Yeah. Um, where else can you? Uh, who else commands thousands of people at a time? No one, but you can definitely uh, identify with the feller that wants to go fishing in the Cumberland River and make his little um, blackberry uh, cobblers. You know that that that's the people you can relate to, and that's how you can make the war become real. And one reason I started so back in Abraham Lincoln's life on the uh, on this uh, on this show is because. I wanted you to understand where he came from. He is a poor boy from the backwoods of Kentucky, and he ri- rises up to be president of the United States, and he carries a lot of that, uh, ex- those experiences that he had as a child all the way up into his uh, adult life, all the death that he experienced in his life, which uh, he saw his mother pass away, his sister passes away. Uh, he loses uh, children along the way. What was the second kid? Uh, you mentioned the first one that died at four. There was one that died when he was in the White House too, right? Yeah, one of them dies in the White House, and that's uh, Willie, I do believe. Yeah, Willie. Willie. Uh, do you remember what, call, what the cause of death was with him? I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was typhoid fever. Okay. Uh, it might have been. Um. He named him William Wallace Lincoln, uh, which I always got a kick out of when I talk about uh, Willie in class and I always put up a picture of Mel Gibson as Braveheart. Um, just cause, and some people get the reference, some people don't. William Wallace, uh, <laughs> William Wallace Lincoln. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I do believe it was typhoid fever, though, that w- killed him. And that happened to a lot of, or at least if it wasn't typhoid, it was some kind of gastrointestinal problem. And we see that happen a lot in Washington, D.C., because the water quality is horrible. And so when you have this horrible water quality, you're going to see a lot of uh, intestinal viruses and things that will hurt you and kill you to some extent. And we we think that uh, Zachary Taylor, the president, when he dies in office, um, might have got something from the horrible drinking water. Yeah, did he have some cherries or something? That... Or that, I think it's William Henry Harrison. William Henry, William Henry Harrison, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. Typhoid <laughs> fever was horrible. It was a, ran rampant in Washington, D.C. simply because of the horrible water quality. You know, we've talked about those quotes while I go. There's one that I love that I forgot for. Uh, well, two actually. Uh, uh, when, um, uh, I thought, was it um, Mosby and Pickett that went to see Lee and he said, That damn no man cost me my division? The, that's the that, that's the rumor. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how true that is. There's been historians that try to dec- decipher that out. Yeah, I, I heard his wife may have embellished that. I think she did. She embellished a lot of things, and that's why we can't really because she wrote the book on Pickett. I don't yeah. think we can trust her as much because Pickett got a bad reputation near the end of the war, especially um, for all the horrible <laughs> stuff he did, and so. She tried to save his reputation. I think she went a little bit too far uh, in doing that and exaggerated a lot of things. And she so did a great I, Yeah, I don't know if we can trust that story. And then the other one was, uh, I forget, I think, I don't know if they were at a reunion or a funeral or something. And uh, Joe Wheeler shows up and Longstreet supposedly busts out and says, uh, Joe, I hope I go before you do so I, so I can be at the. Uh, gates of hell when Jubal early cussed you for wearing that blue uniform <laughs> or yeah. something to that effect uh, 
uh, say, but, uh, like you said, having uh, sitting down with Robert E. Lee and jo- Joseph E. Johnson after the war must have been a really neat conversation. And I'd love to have uh, sat down with any uh, any group of those gentlemen and just heard heard what they had to say. Um, and probably some of it would be pretty outlandish too, because uh, again, they were trying to sa- trying to save their reputation. Well, you know the look of. Uh, <laughs> Just the way Johnston and Lee was looking at each other, just the same like they was very uncomfortable <laughs> in that setting. Um, they might have been. Um, it, it's a weird feeling, I guess. It's hard for me to understand because we don't exactly know. Uh, we've never had that in, uh, that experience of we've rebelled against the federal government and now we're back in it. You know, what next? And are uh, those, that, that, that's a big question. And are they sitting there going, you know, Johnson said they're going, if I hadn't been relieved of command, you know, we, this thing would have been different. <laughs> Are they blaming each other for who called, who lost the war? Uh, you know, really, yeah, what, what are they thinking? But no, it's uh, those are fun questions, and I, I wish there was more uh, research or at least more uh, sources available to actually talk about these discussions that were had by, between these commanders because they, 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 they met each they met each other plenty of times after the war especially uh, there's many that lived up into the 1900s and yeah. so uh, the, i know that they had plenty of different uh, plenty of conversations they said they had conversations with one another and i'd love to have been in the room with any of them yeah i, I mean I've, I've read a lot of uh you know, you can only go back with, with letters and stuff like that. But I mean, yeah, I would have loved to sit down and heard that. Um, so, uh, what what's next, man? Um, we're coming up on what November? We've did Western Theater, uh, Lincoln. Um, I don't, I don't know. You're, what do you think? Let's. Uh, let me think here. We could probably dive into. Well. Let's do this. This will kind of help me out. Uh, let's go over my uh, dissertation. All right. Yeah. And, that, uh... and, and, and what, I, what, I, what I will do is I will top up some bullet points and I will send them to you. So you'll have an idea yeah. of some of the main topics that I'm talking about. So you can kind of do your own digging. So you'll have some questions to kind of follow up on. Yes. And that, is... uh, that way we can kind of have a nice little back and forth. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Um, All right. Thanks a lot, man. Hope you get feeling better, and uh, uh, we'll talk I soon. I appreciate it. No, this, right, was, this was great. We'll, we'll <laughs> see you later. All right, buddy. Bye. Bye.